bán con này thế nào? to Africa about 40 years ago and the motivation was adventure and wilderness. I was hoping to find all the wild which in Switzerland where I came from had largely already gone. That's the Somali ostrich. He has his own to heart for the Somali ostrich. The young Somali was blowing it. We spent a lot of time in the bush, did a lot of beautiful wildlife photography, the kind of imagery which was sellable and still is sellable, but soon realized that there's another side to the story, that besides the beautiful lions in the Masai Mara, there are whole big areas of Africa where the lions are being wiped out very fast. So I started documenting the other side to the story, like the, the bush meat trade and the wildlife trade. You know, we can't just keep selling beautiful pictures when I constantly see that there's another side to this coin and let me start doing some of this, you know, work and try to create awareness what the other side of the coin looks like. Shortly after having set foot in Africa, Carl travels straight to the parts the novelist Joseph Conrad called the heart of darkness. Traveling up the Congo River, Carl made a discovery that would impact his outlook on conservation and his life in general. One of the greatest adventures in Africa and possibly the world, you know, it's, I mean, you live with thousands of people on these barges. All the hunters come in with their pirogues to deliver their ware, to sell them to the people on board. There were brothels there, there were bars there. I mean, you know, hairdressers, the whole works. So it was a whole village chucking up the Congo River. 
Carl couldn't overlook the constant flow of wild animals being brought on board, many of which were endangered primates. These are smoke monkeys bundled up, heads cut off, so it's impossible to tell what type they are, but there are probably quite a few chimpanzees among them. Bloody hell, I didn't realize this was going on. And we saw two chimps come on board, you know, and uh, the, the hunter had to go back on his pirogue to his family. You know, he was going to end up in a coking pot if nobody pulled it alive and looked after. It was as simple as that. It was going to be meat. And, you know, even then you looked in the eyes of the little guy and said, come on, there must be another solution. Despite all the shocking impressions, an opportunity to intervene presented itself to Carl and his wife, Catherine. So they adopted the little chimpanzee and named him Mizé. Mizé! OK, thank you. As far as a captive setting, this is as good as it can get. So, uh, you know, once they're humanized, you're just going to have to accept they're going to live in captivity for the rest of their life, and you have to try to do the best to improve their life quality, which means enrichment, so they don't get too bored. So spending time with them is a key aspect of enrichment, but it's also very enjoyable. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, Lord, I love you. I love you. It was at this stage that Carl decided he had to raise awareness about our impact on the planet and its wildlife. His books on the bushmeat trade got a lot of attention worldwide. At last vegetarians put here on the skunks, the flies and chimpanzees and all the bushmeat market in Point Noir. You had a very personal relationship with a creature which, you know, you treated like your own child and, you know, interacted like you would with your old child. To then see them butchered and eaten for meat, it was just something where you said, OK, I mean, this is a red line. I have to try to do something. If the world doesn't know about, they should know about. If they know about, they should decide, can this go on? In the years to follow, Carl kept documenting the decline in natural habitats from Central Africa to Southeast Asia, and with it, the extinction of a wide range of wildlife species. I have seen my share of wild animals in all kinds of wild settings in Asia and Africa, but never a tiger. And it has always been one of my dreams to encounter a wild tiger in a really wild setting. Over the years, Carl has traveled to many of the countries that still claim to have a viable population of tigers in their national parks. So this is male tigers. tigers like our but all he's ever gotten in front of his camera after many expeditions into remote corners are the footprints of one single tiger. On the other hand, he's constantly been offered various tiger parts and products. This is this tiger bone. This is from the same tiger. Very different than what it is now. Now it's just high rises wherever you Carl go. takes his assistant Martin back to the beginnings of his tiger trade investigation, which he has pursued for the last decade. And basically the whole tiger story started here. It started with these two clouded leopard cups and I decided I wanted to get a closer look at them, played with them a little bit, but then the owner became pretty unhappy and locked them away again. They but, were for sale? Or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, everything is for sale down this corridor. There would have been bears, you know, fully grown bears in cages for sale at that time. Today it's a little bit more hidden, but it's, it's still happening. And there was a lorry driver who came up to our local guy and said, look, I know where there's two tiger cubs. So we decided to go and look into it and uh, went to this village and started looking around for the two tiger cubs. The search for the two tiger cubs became an obsession, stretching over years and across several countries in Southeast Asia, including China. 
At the Vietnam border, Carl was shocked to discover that the mother of the two tiger cubs was poached using a particularly gruesome method. Local hunters demonstrated to him how they set up a trip mine, a craft their fathers had learned during the Vietnam War. I knew tigers were being poached. I knew that everybody knows that the Chinese use it for potency and that's the main threat to tigers. I had never heard of a scenario where hunters were using trip mines and dynamites to blow up wildlife, and certainly not in the case of tigers being blown up. But after many more trips to the area, Carl could still find no sign of the two tiger cubs. Only more and more questions. But it's tiger, right? The more he asked about the products or the two live tiger cubs, the more pushback he experienced. Carl felt that he needed to camouflage his investigations better if he wanted to gain deeper insight into the illegal wildlife trade. Lipsticks, we have used very successfully. The quality is very good. You do this when nobody pays attention, you get away with it. You quite often get away with several minutes, maybe even half an hour of looking around without any problems before somebody says, hey, hey, this guy is not quite uh, what he says he is. But that's about the maximum you can take into the field and still pretend to be a tourist. Two years after their mother was blown up, Carl continues the search for the two tiger cubs. They are most likely the last two wild tigers captured in Laos. By that time, we knew that the two tiger cubs had been caught and sold to a Vietnamese trader who most likely trafficked them into Vietnam. It then became our mission to meet some of these traders which were buying up some of these last tigers coming out of Laos. For the first time, a hidden camera comes into play well camouflaged behind sunglasses. In these back rooms, he uncovers a rich collection of tiger and other wildlife products. <laughs> to gain access to dealers in the illegal tiger trade, Carl needs the support of local fixers. Some of them prefer to remain anonymous to avoid possible repercussions. For them, they do take a certain risk, so you have to discuss that pretty frankly up front. But uh, I believe that kind of infiltration is the only way to really get to the bottom of who is who in this business and who is behind it, how do they operate. <laughs> One of Carl's operatives is trying to find more dealers in the border region to inquire about tiger products. We then also checked out the border a little bit further south, and my guys approached a custom official saying, look, uh, we want to go to Laos looking for wildlife products, especially tiger. He said, oh yeah, that's my business, that's what I do. Just place the order with me and I can deliver them in Hanoi or wherever you want. <laughs> With the help of a corrupt customs official, they quickly find what they're looking for. Uh, so he's a big dealer. He stores a frozen tiger, a different plate. And then um, uh, he, say, he told me uh, uh, today he got only a frozen tiger he bought from a supplier in Lao. Nhưng mà bán này có vết chứ không? Bán này có vết chứ mẹ con này còn nguyên cả này. Why did they freeze it? 
What happens is they come across the border and the meat is here pretty valuable, so they didn't want just bones or the skin or the teeth or what have you. In this case, they actually wanted the meat or the whole carcass. So the clients buy the whole tiger like that? And... They buy the whole tiger at a specific kilo price. Where do these tigers come from? How is this possible if there are no more big cats in the wild in this region? Carl is traveling to Thailand. He wants to visit Tiger Kingdom, one of the biggest tiger zoos in the country, because he has information indicating that they might be involved in the commercial tiger trade. The Tiger Kingdom in Chiang Mai in northern Thailand opened its doors to the public in May 2008. Co-owned by an ex-member of parliament, Chuit Pitak Pon Ponlop, it is a top tourist destination, above all, if you want to get into close contact with tigers. While it looks quite an idyllic setting, these two guys playing in the water, uh, last time they told me they breed 40 tigers a year. The price to watch the babies is considerably higher than the adults or play with the babies, so they know the value is in the babies. So breeding is one of the commercial priorities here. Breeding tigers purely for commercial purposes without contributing to the conservation of tigers in the wild is in contravention of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, to which Thailand is a signatory. Observing the petting operation at Tiger Kingdom, Carl notices that the math doesn't add up. How can there be so many babies and young tigers, yet so few sexually mature adults? When I asked that question, they said they give them to other zoos. Now, that's a very unlikely scenario. And like all these captive breeding facilities, the chance is high that they disappear out the back door and are sold as TCM products for bones and skins, etc. Today, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, dreams of turning TCM into a global brand and hopes it will one day conquer the world. More than six million inhabitants live in the capital, with many keen to sample whatever comes in from the bush, be it meat or medicine. The illegal trade and consumption of wildlife are one of the greatest threats facing biodiversity globally. When it comes to the consumption of wild game meat, uh, it's more pronounced in Vietnam than even in China. There's whole regions which have empty forest syndrome. I mean, anything which is wild is hunted and for consumption, eating consumption. The dwindling numbers of wildlife have only driven prices even higher. Increasing the incentive for poachers to hunt down whatever remains. The growing scarcity turns the consumption of rare creatures into a show of status. Yeah, they butcher it in front of you and you can watch it being served. The big shots, the big bosses congregating to consume wildlife products, pretty much just like the bushmeat trade in Central Africa. At a restaurant, the owner offers Carl a product that he hasn't encountered so far, produced with boiled down tiger. Even though it simply consists of gelatin and denaturized protein, 
The so-called tiger cake, or glue, is the lifestyle vitamin of choice for segments of Vietnamese society. The restaurant owner wants to demonstrate to Carl the power and strength that comes with the consumption of tiger cake. That was a fast one. OK, you win. Not only restaurant owners believe in the power of the product, also conventional doctors seem to consider tiger cake to have some medicinal value. His local operative has no trouble obtaining a prescription from a nearby pharmacy. The doctor then recommended two friends of his who were somewhere nearby. I'd met these two guys and asked them about the doctor, having said that you are very happy with his product and the effectiveness of it all. There is a lot of status need associated with showing off these products, not very different from a Rolex and a Porsche. Although eating tiger is a status symbol, law enforcement does occasionally take place. In this case, the police initiated a raid on a restaurant where tiger banquets, which attract an exclusive clientele, regularly took place. During these events, which can cost up to a total of $40,000, whole tigers are cooked and consumed. It was not too difficult to find out who the woman in question was, uh, where was she was located. We went there. She was still active with a restaurant. She hadn't been put in jail or whatever. And she was quite open, said, yes, I mean, let's talk quietly about this, but, you know, here's what I do, and here are the items I have to show you at the moment. Here's a glass of tiger wine for you. <laughs> Tiger wine is produced by soaking tiger bones or whole tiger skeletons in grain-based liquor. The aging process can take years and adds to the value of the product. Carl takes a piece of tiger cake back with him to arrange for DNA analysis. And each time we visited her, we pushed it a little bit further. We got a little bit more information. She kept saying about wild tigers versus captive bred tigers, the difference that her tigers came from Burma, which potentially still has some wild tigers left. When asked how she differentiates between wild and captive bred tigers, she explained, you can tell by the teeth. Wild tigers have rather used teeth, which are yellow and cracked, while the zoo animals' teeth are snow white. She confirmed that there is a market for captive bred as well as for wild tigers. They both end up on the banquet table. And, you know, she then also explained that her husband, who had died in an accident recently, was a very high army officer, and a lot of these banquets had been arranged for the army elite, uh, was kind of the in thing to do, and so she was fully protected via her husband and his position within the army, and even now, after he was dead, she had access to the right people, and that's the way it normally works in these parts of the world. The wildlife trade has gone to a level in terms of monetary reward that it tends to go up very high. You know you need patronage, you know you need protection, but now you can afford to offer type of bribes which get you pretty much to the very top. One of the biggest wildlife traffickers still seems to enjoy government protection. The name Visay Kiyosavang has become synonymous for depleting wildlife worldwide. He is responsible for illegally importing and exporting thousands of pangolins, primates, reptiles, and he was one of the masterminds behind the pseudo-hunting scheme of hundreds of rhinos in South Africa. His deputy, Chumlong Lengtong Tai, was sent to prison for 40 years for his involvement in the scam. The accused is by sentence to undergo 40 years. 
Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Thank you. While Kyosavang himself remained free, his deputy was released after only five years behind bars. Both of them benefit from a corrupt system said to extend to the highest levels of government. The US Department of State has issued a $1 million reward for information leading to the dismantling of the Tiersavang network, a company owned by none other than Visay Kiyosavang. Carl knows that he can't get close to a kingpin like Kiyosavang on his own, so he calls up his Vietnamese operative to establish contact. Kiyosavang is baited by asking him for the going price of Rhino Horn. After a few phone calls, an appointment is confirmed. They meet Kiyosavang at his car dealership just outside the village of Paksan. The alleged wildlife trafficking kingpin seems wary and carefully checks out Carl's local investigators. He asks some detailed questions. They pass the initial interrogation and then are invited to his home. Kiyosavang lives in a villa outside of town. The operatives are literally entering the lion's den. After offering his visitors a seat, Kyosavang reveals that he has been dealing with bones for years, not only tiger bones, but also and mostly lion bones. Why would an Asian kingpin like Kyosavang invest in African lion bones? With tiger bones in scarce supply, lion bones are being substituted to make fake tiger cake. Lion bones are legal to import with the right permits. They are then smuggled across the border into neighboring Vietnam and China, where a $1,800 lion skeleton imported from South Africa gets turned into fake tiger products worth up to 60,000 US dollars. Kyo Savang becomes wary of the probing questions posed by his visitors. <laughs> One of Carl's local operatives is spotted by an employee while filming with his mobile phone. He now fears for his life. Oh, they take a picture of me. They be saw you in the car. This car take me there, you know? Oh, my God. My God. Carl understands that his Vietnamese investigator needs to leave Laos as quickly as possible to protect him from possible retribution. I will see you again. Yeah, hopefully, OK? If major players like Kiyosavang have chosen to get involved with the illegal tiger trade and are even importing substitute products like lion bone on an industrial scale, the demand must be far greater than originally assumed. To find out more about how the supply chain works, Carl digs deep into the official trade database of CITES, the UN Wildlife Trade Convention meant to keep all of this trade sustainable. Kiyosavang confirmed he imported more than eight tons of lion bones in a month, apparently exploiting a well-established business model in South Africa called cant hunting. Cage-raised lions are released into a paddock where meat is tied to a tree. While they feed, the so-called trophy hunter is taken into the enclosure and shoots, with no fair chase principle being adhered to. We are not in conservation business primarily. We are in, in commercial business. We are farming with animals, lions primarily, like, like cattle, like, like sheep. It's, a, it's a, a commercial item. The trophy is then carted away and taken to the taxidermist. Here the circle closes. Hunting clients tend to take only the skin with the mounted head. According to permits Carl has obtained, it is the taxidermists who then export the lion bones. We do not know how many tons they ship annually, but we do know it's a lucrative secondary revenue stream for everyone involved.
One of the leading field biologists and tiger experts of our times lives here. George Schaller has spent most of his life in Africa, South America and Asia, studying lions, mountain gorillas, jaguars and pandas. He is also vice president of Panthera, a conservation organization trying to conserve the world's last big cats. George is watching the footage Carl brought back from his trips. I'm amazed how little these countries do. What is, however, known that Cambodia lost all its tigers already. Laos and Vietnam, they're essentially finished, except for an odd stray one. Myanmar, they're going to disappear. It's only one or two areas. China doesn't have tigers left across the border. But look, I sit here in the United States and criticize. But you know how many tigers are in captivity in the United States? Probably six, seven, eight thousand. Nobody knows exactly because most of them are in private hands in their backyards and so forth, not in zoos. There are more tigers living in captivity in the US than there are in the wild. Many live in terrible conditions. The desire to own big cats seems to have spread around the world. In Arab countries, predators are a luxury product and used as accessories in pictures to be shared on social media. This worldwide problem also exists in the heart of Europe. Police in the Czech Republic raided an illegal slaughterhouse close to Prague. Here tigers are butchered, processed into traditional medicines, luxury items, and are then sold within Europe or exported to Asia. After many other encounters with traffickers and consumers throughout Asia, Carl is now certain that operations like Tiger Kingdom in Thailand are actively involved in the illegal tiger trade. Yet he still doesn't have conclusive proof, so he returns to the facility to find more evidence. If Tiger Kingdom is actively breeding tigers here, then there must be a clue where it all takes place and where all the sexually mature cats end up. Back here is the breeding part of this operation. Nobody's allowed in. And obviously, uh, these are transport cages. That means animals are moved in and out of this area regularly. Considering the existence of three such franchise operations, with more planned to open, there must be a huge surplus of adult tigers. All these tigers, what yeah. happens to them? And they are more than three years old. Uh, after three years old, we're going to keep them in another section to be the breeders, because here they, yeah. all of them were born here. And we are also have zoo in another province. Another branch zoo of Tiger Kingdom is in Ubon Ratchatani. The link to the facility up north is obvious. Transportation trucks and an assortment of metal transport cages indicate that big cats are shifted back and forth regularly. But the zoo itself seems deserted and looks very run down and desolate. A Thai operative whose identity hasn't yet been compromised persuades a worker to open up about what he witnessed a while ago. In the wild, tiger cubs spend up to two years with their mothers, being groomed for life. In some cages, wooden boxes are provided as birthing enclosures. 
The newborn cubs are removed from their mothers to accelerate the reproductive cycle. Carl's local operative has progressed well with his discussions around the tiger trade. The manager confirms having provided the original breeding stock for a facility in Laos, where tigers are apparently bred and sold on a massive scale. He also boasts about a tigress with a legendary birth rate. Carl's worst fears have turned into more than a hunch. One of the most endangered animals in the world is being bred on a massive scale for social status and human consumption. Based on what the manager of the Tiger Kingdom branch reveals, there is obviously an illegal trade between tiger zoos and private breeding facilities going on, from where live tigers are trafficked domestically and internationally. Are these zoos just mere fronts for selling animals and their parts? If so, this is illegal. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, known as CITES, is a 183 signatory UN body that is meant to regulate the trade in wildlife. Moreover, CITES decision 14.69 explicitly states that tigers should not be bred for trade in their parts and derivatives. Zoos like Tiger Kingdom are breaking international law unless their breeding activities contribute to the conservation of tigers in the wild. It's almost a year since the million dollar bounty was placed on Kyosavang by the US State Department. The question is, if anything has changed. Last time I was here, there was still the big sign outside saying Kyosavang trading. The sign no longer exists, apparently no longer lives here. So there has been considerable pressure. Hi. Kyosavang's son comes to the gate. You speak English? Yes, I can speak. Oh, good to know. How can I meet Mr. Visai? Mr. Visai, he's not here. Don't take a picture. Why not? Why do you take a picture? We want to see Mr. Visai. But he's not here. He's not here. Carl decides to leave, but the situation heats up. The son and daughter run after Carl and insist he deletes the footage. Delete it. If ah. you don't delete it, we will have the police. Carl plays it safe and hires a second car to get back to Vientiane, the capital. A prudent decision, as his local operative in the original rental car is stopped by the police. But are you sure she called police? Sure. Because the police checked the car, the van. Never check like a we dry. Ne, never. So did they say what they're looking for in the van? Just, just stop and look inside. No foreigner. Just let us go. Vixi Kiyosavang was a military intelligence official who had access to the prime minister and there was licenses given to him by the prime minister's office, quotas, which clearly came at a huge bribe price. So once you're in that league of making money, you can then take care of the very top echelon in terms of bribes. And that's the point we have reached now. Carl sees that the U.S. bounty has had some effects. Kyosavang is obviously in hiding, but it's also clear that his family and him still have connections. Carl decides to pay the U.S. ambassador to Laos, Daniel Kloon, a visit to ask him what other steps are planned to dismantle the Kyosavang network. What we want to do is uh, take the time to gather evidence and cooperate with our partners, international partners, including the government, of Laos uh, to uh, dismantle this network, to prosecute the individuals who have committed crimes. And I think there's very, very powerful allies in, in the struggle. I, I think you know that uh, President Putin in, in Russia is personally concerned. So we have to you know, continue the good fight. And I'm confident that over the years, we will make progress on this issue.
It becomes increasingly clear that trade in tigers and related products is under the control of organized crime networks that are spread throughout Southeast Asia. Carl and his local investigators have taken some risks to get to this point, but more work needs to be done to uncover other major players involved in the trade. Now, one of Carl's primary missions is uncovering how tigers and their body parts are transported illegally throughout Southeast Asia. One of these routes is the mighty Mekong River, which connects many parts of Southeast Asia. Obviously, a lot of traffic on the Mekong River as far as merchandise being illegally trafficked. There are many jetties up the river where illegal transactions can take place. These include tigers. Adult tigers have very little value as far as the tourist petting income is concerned. So they're then being shipped across here. One of the final destinations is said to be 30 kilometers outside of Takek. With over 400 tigers, the Muang Tong Tiger Farm is rumored to be the biggest breeding facility in the region. One of its directors confirms to Carl that Takek was also the final destination for the two tiger cubs he had been looking for, as well as the two clouded leopards that started his investigation in the first place. We're here at the edge of the main tiger farm in Laos. Uh, it's on army land. It's operated essentially by army personnel. As a foreigner, it's impossible to access the compound. So a drone is employed to give Carl an idea of the scale of the operation. A fenced-in area clearly contains rows of breeding compartments and is well guarded from a watchtower. Carl stages an investigation into the Takek tiger farm, again using local operatives to gain information. Because customers at the tiger farm are mainly Chinese and Vietnamese, Carl enlists a Mandarin-speaking colleague to play the role of an interested buyer. Carl's investigator counts more than 20 very young tigers. They are raised here and sold only when they reach the age of four, at prices based on their body weight. The tiger farm is expanding rapidly, it is already home to 400 tigers, but its bosses are planning to double its capacity. Customers mainly from Vietnam and China pay up to 50,000 US dollars for an adult tiger. As planned, they met with some of the current owners of the farm. Luang in the white shirt is Vietnamese. Kian Singh is in a black suit and he looks after financial matters, whereas Aldoni in the middle handles all the permits, bribes, and organizes helicopter transport with the Laotian army. Luang confirms that there's an increasing demand, mostly from China, and that the prices are about to rise from 250 to 285 US dollars per kilo. Chinese buyers prefer the males to use their penises for producing a very exclusive tiger wine. On the Chinese internet, it is easy to find out what happens with the tigers once they are sold. This footage illustrates one of the brutal execution methods employed. The animal is electrocuted using electrodes powered by a household generator. Customers witness the tiger being killed and thereafter often butchered on the spot, making it easier to carry and to prove to the client that they are getting the real thing. The tiger is the world's most admired creature according to this animal planet research. Now, you know, if the world's most admired creature is speed bread and factory farm to be butchered for body parts, that's, you know, something I will never be able to get my head around. And uh, as I said, that's, I think, the message. Where do we stop? What's going to be next?
There is a growing disparity between tradition and modernity in Southeast Asian societies. Rapid economic growth is driving the demand for all kinds of luxury commodities, while at the same time, the myth around consuming wildlife products for health or potency doesn't seem to be fading. The more recent trend of showing off one's wealth has amplified the problem. More and more people can afford status symbol items. Wildlife products, especially tiger wine, are often bought to be handed out as gifts and bribes. But not only luxury items are becoming more popular. Also tiger theme parks, including safari parks and zoos, are accessible to a greater public in China. In this park, there is a special attraction for an additional fee. Visitors can tease tigers with a piece of meat or a live animal. This kind of entertainment fuels the demand for more tigers. Carl also discovers the all too familiar link to a tiger entertainment facility he already knows well. The tiger petting business has arrived from Thailand and the Yunnan Wild Animal Park hosts one of the first tiger petting operations in China. The number of tigers in this facility has tripled in only a few years, and there is little doubt that it has long become part of the tiger supply chain. They now say they have 200 tigers, so this is clearly a tiger farm, and they're not here for the visitors to adore or to pet or to view only. The big money is made when they're adults and can be sold out the back door. Not far away, Carl visits the old tiger zoo in Guilin. Here, it seems tigers were starved to death. If an animal dies of natural causes, it is legal to use their body parts. A particularly cruel loophole in the system. Take picture, no? It is no surprise that this facility is now closed but only for it to have reopened on a much larger scale in an area further out of town. Starving zoo tigers hasn't satisfied the demand in China, so the speed breeding approach seems to have become the method of choice, and is the reason why, in China, more and more tiger breeding facilities have been opening up across the country. The Siberian Tiger Park holds over a thousand big cats. Not all the animals are on display. They are being kept in long rows of cages, some of which consist of up to a hundred units. Visitors can also have the close-up experiences of feeding the tigers, although public access is only granted to adolescent animals. Very young cubs are nowhere to be seen. Harbin, like the other facilities, claims to prepare their tigers for reintroduction into the wild. If it's true that Chinese farms are successfully reintroducing tigers into the wild, then farming tigers could indeed be the solution. They do have a menu there of what you can buy to feed life to the tigers. Chickens and ducks and goats and cows and donkeys. You buy it and throw it in there and watch them killing it. But to call this preparation for reintroduction into the wild sounds like a fairy tale, in order to justify industrial scale tiger exploitation. In reality, there has never been a successful reintroduction of captive bred tigers back into the wild. How do you introduce them? Those are just pretty words. To actually implement them is one of the most difficult things in conservation. If you want a big predator, you've got to give it natural prey, which means you've got to protect the natural prey. Where is he going to get it? Now the Chinese and the Brazilians and the Indians are all over the world, mining, timbering, drilling for oil, and so forth. So the devastation is huge, and I've seen it in these countries. 
And so I think it's an excuse by people that want to breed them for bones or whatever to say they're doing conservation. It's misleading the public. This is more than proven at the Siberian Tiger Park, a park where it seems they have protection even from the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, Mr. Xi Jinping, whose visit is displayed in the official gallery right next to what looks like a natural history museum, where tiger items like tiger wine from their own production are openly displayed in fancy bottles and sold in a nearby shop with an obviously guaranteed and endless supply. Mankind has commercialized nature for a very long time now. Not just wildlife, but key life-supporting ecosystems. But when it comes to charismatic species like tigers essentially being factory farmed, that makes me very angry. It illustrates where it's all going and how we no longer give nature its intrinsic value. In the end, we're talking about this very small group of people who has these status needs where they want this stuff. And the whole, you know, the, the whole Southeast Asia region is emptied of the last wild tigers, which goes with it. I mean, if, if a captive tiger is worth $50,000, that is known in the villages. So if they know there's a wild tiger still left in the area, they're going to go for it. So, so as I said, it risks the remaining wild tigers as well. After pressure from the international community, the Ministry for Agriculture and Forest announced in 2016 the phasing out of tiger farming in Laos. One of the things which I consider my strength is that I keep going regularly back and update my information, see the evolution of some of these scenarios. This was taken early last year and it showed cages for 100 tigers, maybe less. But uh, then we got uh, back there a few months later and there were already two new buildings which uh, had been coming up in this period. They were clearly again used to farm tigers. You can see the same outside cages again. Uh, this was all after the announcement of Laos that they were closing down the tiger farms. The number of animal farms have increased in general. The Vanaseng tiger farm has doubled its capacity from 100 to 200 tigers. The same owners also have a primate farm that holds roughly 10,000 macaques, each one worth up to 20,000 US dollars when sold and exported as lab animals. Close to the Vietnam border, there is the Laksau tiger farm, which has an estimated capacity of up to 350 tigers which puts its net worth at around 17 and a half million US dollars. April 2019, gunshots ring out near the infamous Muang Tong tiger farm. One of the Takek shareholders, a Thai national called Chok, is gunned down by three assassins in broad daylight. There was some falling out among partners over uh, deliveries of tigers, and uh, so they started fighting. Sarkoni being the principal shareholder, backed by, again, the former prime minister of Laos, but also having a Thai partner, which pretended to be uh, Laotian, this Jock fellow, and then Luang, which was a Vietnamese, which was also a partner, and then some local army police guys. So I think we can use the label mafia in the context of this group of people. 
The crime is still unsolved. Getting real inside information required infiltrating one of the tiger trafficking networks. Over the years, and after many return visits, Carl's fixer became a drinking buddy of the farm manager Nguang Tong, who then moved with Sakhon to another new setup much closer to the Vietnamese border. Besides giving a lot of inside information about tiger farming, he points them to Sakhon's new facility. To find Sakhon, Carl and his team follow up the tip of the farm manager. To their surprise, the front for the alleged tiger farm is a luxury resort that has been under construction since 2017. There was actually bungalows there, which you could rent, a small golf course, two or three holes, which was all built by Sakhon and everybody says the former prime minister being involved very actively. Sakhon is among the top three culprits in Laos when it comes to the illegal tiger and ivory trade. He is responsible for the killing and trafficking of thousands of wild animals. Even after selling his share in the Takek farm, he is still very active and feels safe enough to have numerous social media accounts. At the new Sakhon facility, Carl takes advantage of a new regulation in Laos and is able to simply walk in. That's the new trend in Laos here. They say we're closing the tiger farms down by giving them a zoo license and everything continues just as before. And the world is supposed to swallow it and accept it. But then Thailand did it and got away with it, so why not Laos? But everything we see is tiger farming pattern, individual cages, birding boxes, Males and females paired. Tigers here are being systematically speed bred. Once a day, males and females are let into the same enclosure for mating. Shortly after the mating act, the tigers are separated again. On this trip, Terence McCoy from the Washington Post is following along to report on the latest development in tiger farming in Laos. Hi, big fellow. Hi, big fellow. <laughs> if any of the tigers now sticks his head through that hole, and pushes the gate upwards, the tiger's out here and he's gonna kill one, two, three, four, five people in no time. At dinner time, something completely unexpected happens. Suddenly, Sakon casually shows up to have a drink with his guests. If he suspects Carl and his team of espionage, then he certainly doesn't show it. Look, it's an experience I was not ready for. I didn't know how I was going to react. I, but when you sit there and drink a beer, cheers, you know, it's hard to say you're fucking criminal. I mean, you know, they're human beings too. They do what they think is right. They have their own moral codes and ethical codes and they don't match ours. So, you know, it was, it was hard to then say these are criminals and gangsters and despicable people. Uh, I don't know, it was a real dilemma to be confronted in that sense. This is the Golden Triangle here, there's Burma here, there's Thailand here and there's Laos here, so this makes the triangle. Even after uncovering another key Laotian kingpin, Carl is still not satisfied. He continues to trace the smuggling route up the Mekong River. To pursue their illegal activities, the Chinese maintain enclaves in the neighboring countries. One is called Special Region 4, with its capital, Mongla. A legal black hole with no international oversight. Anything is tolerated. Gambling, prostitution, child sex trafficking, 
and the illegal consumption of protected wildlife are some of the main attractions. Wildlife trade has always been a big issue there because it's in the forest region where there was still a lot of indigenous wildlife which was offered for sale and the Chinese gamblers coming in, of course, uh, had opportunities to order speciality items, bears and everything else. The border with China runs right behind the town. Many Chinese consumers now travel to these enclaves to enjoy activities that are illegal at home. Westerners hoping to enter Special Region 4 from Myanmar need to surrender their passports at the border in exchange for a temporary local one. To maintain law and order, the syndicate who governs the region operates its own military force. These are our local passports in the Republic Union of Myanmar. Okay. So we're citizens now. Karl is joined by Sergei Yastrovensky, the former Russian ambassador to the European Union. While his local fixers scan the shops for illegal wildlife products, Carl and Sergei check out the market. Most of what they find are parts of endangered animals. From tiger parts to elephant skin, to primate meat and other protected species, everything is for sale here. There's quite a bit of fresh meat, I'm surprised. And the crazy thing is, it all takes place completely out in the open. I've seen many of these markets, and obviously there's domestic meat from domestic animals, but there's also wildlife. We now know that zoonosis, this cross-species transmission of virus from animals to human, is a real issue. In the case of the present coronavirus outbreak, it seems to be pretty clear-cut that it started in this Wuhan province in the so-called wet market. These are the markets where people expect to buy very fresh meat. They actually also call it warm market because the meat and the blood is meant to be still warm when you buy it. And as long as this wildlife consumption goes on at this level and the farming of these same species, the risk will be there and is now developed into a serious problem, a worldwide pandemic. It is now up to the world and China to take action in banning wet markets and protecting wildlife. They can show that this time they have learnt their lessons, different to the SARS outbreak in 2003, when after a few months everything simply went back to normal. Otherwise, the next pandemic is inevitable. Meanwhile, the local operatives have no troubles finding even more. One saleswoman extracts a complete range of tiger skulls from a freezer. Allegedly, shop owners do not know if they are wild tigers or animals from breeding farms. In a private backyard, there's a miserably small cage where Carl discovers a fully grown adult tiger. 50,000 US dollars is the asking price, similar to amounts Chinese customers would be paying for an adult tiger in farms like Takek. The next trader doesn't even mind Carl filming the two tiger skins he has on display. He quotes 80,000 yen, or 13,000 US dollars for each. Apparently a lucrative deal with a prospective customer will trump any sense of caution here. Carl digs deeper into the freezer. Slowly the tiger skeleton becomes complete. It seems the closer one gets to the Chinese border, the more tiger wine becomes one of the key products. It used to be for the royal families, the, the very top emperor echelon, who consumed these things, who would sit on tiger skins and so on. And now you have a new class which aspires to, to that status. And that seems to be how most, what drives most of the demand. Yeah. 
I'm actually in the meantime convinced that there's an official policy on the China side of the border as far as moving this illegal wildlife trade into these enclaves across the border. China can say it has nothing to do with us, but everybody knows the consumers are Chinese. They know if they want the stuff, they can just go across the border on a holiday. All this is sold into the international trade. There's no Myanmar going to buy it and take it this way. Every piece is being bought by Chinese consumers and buyers and taken across that international border. No enforcement is taking place. Even though there seems to be little oversight, many visitors still prefer to enter Special Region 4 at an illegal border crossing in the forest that is apparently known to everyone. It is a frequently used trail, as most of the gamblers from China prefer not to have their entry and exit recorded. Crossing on the back of motorbikes in the opposite direction, drugs and illegal wildlife products then leave this lawless place. These guys have some kind of a guard system where they call each other on the mobile phone. Okay, there's a border patrol car going through, so that's what they had heard about. I don't know if they saw us or not, but maybe we'll head slowly back now because these guys are worried, so I guess we should be relatively worried as well. Okay, here we go. Carl and his team are confronted by the officials. Before the police confiscate them, Carl manages to exchange the memory cards on his camera. And unnoticed by the officials, Carl's belt cam keeps rolling. Despite the strident complaints of Carl's local operative, the team is finally taken to the police station. Being detained in a non-existent state without a passport amounts to a worst-case scenario. If the police had indeed found Carl's footage, he and his team could have been locked up for being non-accredited journalists. This time, they got off the hook with an interesting memento of the incident. A day's journey from Mongla, there is yet another such forbidden city. King's Roman is an entertainment mecca. Prostitution, drugs, gambling, and also wildlife banquets draw many visitors to this competing Sin City. It's another legal black hole, a shadow world beyond any laws. And it doesn't stop at the gambling tables. Opposite the casino is a large assembly of cages with an outdoor enclosure. This major tourist attraction is run by the casino management. Originally, it was a collection of bears, but now there are also tigers, some already paired in breeding cages. We were told by the Takek farm guys that they specifically sold them brothers and sisters and told them not to try to breed and not to try to compete with them. The head keeper at the tiger facility is a Chinese citizen brought in from the Yunnan Wild Animal Park in China. Despite the warning not to undertake a breeding program, according to him, this is precisely what the King's Romans management hired him to do. Carl manages to meet the head keeper for dinner. After a few drinks, the man explains that he has eight tiger cubs hidden at his home but all are ill and cannot be visited. Thanks to his tenacity, Carl is able to find a local inbred tiger with serious health issues. We also have testimony from an advisor telling us that uh, he had seen cut up carcasses. Normally a tiger carcass is cut in three parts. It can be added back together, but for shipping purposes it goes in three sections. The gift shops in the Chinatown-themed section of the casino offer a wide range of jewelry items. A lot of them made from tiger parts. Okay, not Colin, this is 
In the back room, Carl and his team are offered a very costly and special item. The list of illegal tiger products on offer seems to be endless in places like these, and the supply chain from the farms is apparently working well. This is asking for trouble. Even though the main players in the business are often unknown or impossible to get to, the former spokesperson to Russian presidents Putin and Yeltsin, Sergei Yastrovensky, offers his very unique insight into the communist systems. I have been in the politics of high level many years, and the 10 years I worked in Kremlin. I was living in communist system for many years, and I know very well that if they want to change something, they can do it. For sure, they know everybody who is involved in this business. So they are not interested in. And uh, I'm sure that political correctness in this field is very harming. It's um, very dangerous because uh, it's, um, it, uh, instead of uh, uh, looking for a solution of the problem, it's uh, just camouflating this problem. The Emperor of Kings Roman is a phantom called Shao Wei. He is not only involved in wildlife, but also drug trafficking, money laundering, and human trafficking. The US Treasury Department put him on a watch list, but he has yet to be brought to justice. Getting close to him is impossible, as he not only enjoys protection from his private army, but also from high-level politicians. To secure his money stream, Xiao Wei operates a wide range of shell companies across the whole region. Xiao Wei also has his own boats which go up and down the Mekong River. And there seems to be a demand on the China side, being in Qinghong or Kunming, that whole region. I'm sure there's tiger banquets on offer there as well, with the meat coming up the Mekong. But Carl doesn't have to look that far. Right here, at the King's Roman Casino, he finds a restaurant with tiger meat on the menu. The most expensive item on the menu, of course, was tiger. Now it's on the ground. It has been advertised by media some few times, so now you have to send in the Chinese and asking for quotation for tiger banquets, and you still get it. In order to maintain his cover and to get a DNA sample of the meat, Carl is forced to step out of his comfort zone further than he ever intended to. He will have to order a dish with meat from the very animal he seeks to protect. I know it's frowned upon by many people, but you know, I took a piece home with me uh, in a little bottle and uh, gave it to the lab in Zurich. A lot of it is fake. You have to know where you can get what. So I thought, I need the DNA analysis. Carl has organized many DNA tests over the past six years. But this one could be his most important sample. He is a well-known client at the Forensic Institute of the University of Zurich. They go through every single one of the samples Carl has brought back from his last trip. Was wir da haben, da sehen wir DNA Sequenz mit den verschiedenen Farben. Das sind die verschiedenen Basenpaar und anhand von dem kann man einen Knochen oder so dann einer Spezies zuordnen. They came back and said yes, definitely tiger. So you know, at least I felt okay. I have established that tiger is being offered. Nobody can say how you probably eat beef and uh, they sold it to you stupid foreigner as tiger. So, you know, that, I mean, that's what I didn't want to walk into. This is 1A. I'm Sasha Ann Simons in Washington. We'll talk about another threat facing tigers with conservationist and wildlife photographer Carl Amon. 
He was recently profiled by the Washington Post in the midst of trying to expose prominent traffickers who operate farms in Laos. The article being out there and people having accepted that it was research, that it wasn't some weirdo like myself coming up with this story, will help other editors to make up their minds. They don't have to worry that I'm dishing up a story which is fabricated or whatever. And that is a big thing if they don't have to do all the fact checking themselves. Wow, what are you doing in the middle of Asia? You belong to Africa. It was the same with the bushmeat story. When the New York Times picked it up, suddenly all the other editors felt safe to go with a similar or the same story. And after eight years of not going public, the time has come to go out with it. And if that blows my cover in some parts, then so be it. But uh, the indications are the Laotians haven't taken it seriously, this Washington Post article. There hasn't been a big hoo-ha. Back in Laos, Carl visits a particular shop in Vientiane, whose owner claims to always have the latest and best selection of wildlife products. She proudly shows him a new item that piques Carl's interest, pink tiger bone bracelets. This is tiger? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's a new one for me. Show me, yeah. Then obviously the next question was, what's the difference between the pink and the normal yellowish white beads? The way of harvesting the bones seems to involve a very gruesome practice. Because they cut, they don't die. They chew and they sleep and they cut. So the, the block uh, inside the bone. So they kill it when it's still alive. I mean, <laughs> kill it when it's still alive. Morning call. <laughs> <laughs> Morning call. When, when they, it's still, uh, you know, they butcher it while it's still alive. Let's put it that way. It just didn't sink in initially. I, you know, I, I was aghast at this, this revelation that, you know, we deboned the tiger while it's still alive. A few months later, Carl sends his Chinese investigators back to the same shop to confirm the initial claim, and possibly also to find out more about the technique behind it. For the pink one, you need to process it. Uh, you can debone the tiger alive, but that will not give a very uh, pink color. That will just be pinkish white. Or you can sedate or use tranquilizer to, to treat the tiger while you debone it. Uh, and that way, may freeze the blood in the bone while you debone it. And the third way is to boil this with uh, tiger blood to sting the tiger bone. We checked with various people, there is a component to it which could be correct, but it's another sales gimmick and she's one of these very sharp big traders who has big internet set up who markets this stuff as well. So it's just one upmanship. If the others have the normal tiger bones, we offer the pink tiger bones with blood in it. The dealers are not only smart when it comes to offering new products, they also find new ways to sell them. Over the last few years, many have moved online. Yeah, lots of stuff. So is this on a website or is this on his phone? Carl wants to find out what amount of the illegal wildlife trade has already moved into cyberspace. His Chinese investigator has ordered some tiger bone jewelry over the internet. It's a trading website, right? Yeah, it's an online trading platform. Um, obviously, the largest trading platform in China. Like, you can buy everything on Taobao. From items like crocodile skin handbags to turtle artifacts, to even more endangered species like pangolin, hornbill, rhino, elephant and tiger, there is nothing that isn't for sale. You didn't find it very difficult to order these items? Uh, let me be clear. It's, it wasn't like very open on Taobao saying that they're selling this stuff. Yeah. So what I did was I contacted this seller 
And then this seller asked me to contact her via WeChat. And then so she just sent me the pictures on her, on his profile. And once you will like see a picture that you are interested, you can send her the picture. Oh, I, I want this and ask for a price. Okay. Jesus, she has a lot of stuff. She updates it every day. See, I just browse two days of updates only. So yeah, this they, must be a big outlet, but you think the production takes place in Fujian? This the location where she said she is from Burma, but then when we speak, she said she's in China. Okay. So she speaks Chinese Mandarin. Okay, but when you talk to her on WeChat, mm. she confirms that it's ivory or tiger or yeah, whatever. Yeah, she confirms everything. So they use emoji to escape surveillance too. Like this is the tiger wallet. They yeah. said it's big cat. So you know how they tweet the keywords. But when you ask her, she will tell you it's tiger. She demonstrates how easily you can find special items like pink tiger bone jewelry just by altering some keywords. The illegal wildlife products that were once offered in brick and mortar shops are accessible worldwide, 24 hours a day, online. Tech giants like Alibaba or WeChat prefer to look away and in doing so are clearly facilitating and eradicating the last remaining wild tigers. They have the expertise, they have the financial resource. They could absolutely scan all, all this imagery into a database which would allow them to then search all the corresponding websites, even though they might use uh, you know, keywords which have nothing to do with the product. So if they really want to get to the bottom of it, they could. When I'm here, there's the computer and there's the emails and there's all that stuff going on. So even when I'm here, it's not easy to relax. But the piece of land we have here is part of an ecosystem which is relatively intact. There's a lot more elephants coming in here now than when we arrived here 30 years ago. There's no shooting of any kind in here. If we hear a shot, we report it immediately. There's no hunters with dogs. That gives a certain level of security, which again allows the elephants to feel pretty safe and happy here. Bordering the National Reserve and the Forest Reserve here allows me to appreciate the best of it all, but it's then so much harder to see how we are destroying some of these similar ecosystems in other parts of the world. As Thailand and other countries in the region have shown, all one needs is a zoo license to get away with almost any aspect of illegal wildlife trading. China, Laos and Vietnam are replicating this business model. In China, this is now happening on a very large scale, with over 100 new zoos and safari parks having come on stream or in the process of development. They all sell a feel-good conservation story Discussing the rewilding of some of these born in captivity or farmed wildlife is often part of their marketing approach. Whereas in fact the zoo industry is a big part of the problem itself. If a country wants its large predators, whether it's a lion or a jaguar or a tiger, it's got to protect them in the wild. But are countries capable of protecting indigenous habitat for tigers when they don't seem to be able to stop the illegal wildlife trade? For well over two decades, Carl has tried to create awareness with policymakers and CITES delegates. We would like to ask if we can get an interview. No, now it's a pause. It's about the trade on the Burmese-Chinese border. Hello, please. Go out. That's not a good idea. Why not? Because we told you. Because we told you to go here, not here. We have still a few questions. Carl's shocking revelations are being permanently ignored by officials. 
In the meantime, the killing and trade of wildlife goes on at an ever-increasing speed. Hey, UN people, you know, there's a convention, there's big shots with a big salary sitting in Geneva. They know this. How can they go through life sitting at their desk knowing that they're wasting their time or, you know, are part of the problem? Uh, and that, that gets to me. By now I have had 30, 40 years of enjoying what nature has to offer, admiring it, hoping that other people feel similar or would, have, if they had the opportunity, would feel the same way. So it's also kind of giving back to say, if, if not now, then when are we going to try to preserve these last, you know, intact ecosystems like this one? So illustrating what's wrong with it, hopefully it might lead to change. I mean, it's the only hope there is, in my opinion. I would like humanity to accept that, you know, the way we are going, we're going to come to the end of the road. And the tiger is probably a symbol of where we are going wrong. A few years ago, I sat on an embankment on a lake in Switzerland, and next to me there was some graffiti on a wall, and the graffiti said, the whole of creation is waiting for us to become humans.